For those who arrived recently, I'm Lawrence Krauss. I'm uh, director of the Origins Initiative here at ASU. And it's my great pleasure in a minute to introduce my friend and colleague, Brian Green. Uh, Brian needs little introduction. He's probably known to many of you. He's not only a distinguished theoretical physicist and one of the people driving a very exciting area of physics called string theory, but he's one of the most successful and well-known popularizers of physics or, or, in fact, of science in this country and around the world. Now, what we've decided to do is something a little bit different. Because many of you may have seen his television show or read his books, what we thought in order to provide a, uh, in, in some sense, a break from the continuous lecture format is, uh, is we're going to have a, a dialogue and we're going to talk together about, about some of the issues that, of physics and, and science education and communication and then, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. So uh, I'm very proud and pleased to uh, welcome Brian Green to the stage here today. Brian. Thanks, Brian. This will be an interesting experiment to see how it goes. I thought we'd begin by asking, uh, in some sense, what, what made you become a physicist? What got you excited? And, and why did you choose the area of physics that you ultimately decided to work in? You know, I've never, I've never thought uh, about that before. Um, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a great question. I, you know, I think like many of us, and it's probably true for you too, and I've never spoken to our community, but I started in mathematics. You know, as a little kid, my dad would set me these little problems, and I was just amazed at how, with just a few little tools of knowledge, you could actually calculate things, you know, multiply numbers and do calculations that perhaps no one had done before. No one had done before because they weren't interesting, but it, but it was still, <laughs> you know, fun for a kid to do. And then later on, I must have been 12 or 13 or 14, yeah, I went through the kind of thing that most everyone goes through. Why am I here? What's it all about? All that kind of those interesting questions, those deep questions. And it just occurred to me that if, if people are still asking those questions, there must not really be some fundamental answer. So maybe the best you could do is try to understand the question. And when I learned that math could help you learn about those questions, you know, how the universe began, even what it means to ask that question, I was pretty hooked. So that's interesting. You came in from math, I think. Yeah. What about your parents? Did they... Uh, were they surprised, disappointed? My mother wanted me to be a doctor, for example, and she was very disappointed when I became a physicist. Uh, are you Jewish? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah I, I've had exactly the same experience. In fact, I still have that, that, that experience. Yeah, well, I got um, a job at Harvard. My mother said, uh, I remember my first job at Harvard was a nice job, and my mother said, it's still not too late. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my, my dad was a, a composer. Oh, okay. And uh, as uh, with many composers, it's very hard to make a living. So he supported the family by playing bass fiddle at uh, you know weddings and bar mitzvahs and, and things like that. Really? And, and he was a vocal coach as well, uh, a singer. Um, my mom was a, a secretary for a veterinarian. So it was not a very traditionally academic household. What, what about... I know one of the reasons I write books, so I wonder if it's a reason for you. What about, did you read books by scientists? For me, that was very inspirational. Did that, that affect you at all? It did, a little bit later on. You know, I somehow didn't know about this whole area of, of science books without the technical details until I was at least sort of 13 or 14. Huh. But it was really two books. It was, it was a Carl Sagan, you know, Cosmos, but it was also The Ascent of Man, yeah. Bronowski. And those two really just stuck with me as a very potent way of communicating information without having to go to a course, without having to study it. And so that certainly was with me all through my education as something I valued. Okay, so why then physics and not mathematics, although? Well, it was really just a recognition that math, you set yourself the problems, whereas in physics, nature sets you the problems. So it felt like you had the capacity to, in the most grandiose language, sort of touch eternity. You know, if you were lucky, if you were among the lucky few whose work actually was relevant to the world, you'd be revealing something that could stand the test of time. And that, to me, just had this, this pull. Okay, now, now we got to physics, particle physics and ultimately string theory. What was the, what, what about that? 
Uh, well, when I was in, in college, I had a real obsession with gravity. <laughs> and I'm hesitating. So, you know, I think I think that's true of pretty well all students, actually. Yeah. Well, well, I'm hesitating a little bit because it's a little bit odd. I, I mean, you know, I mean, many of you may be familiar too, but you know well Steven Weinberg's book. Yeah. You know, gravitation and that's cosmology: principles and applications yeah. of general theory of relativity. And, you know, it's this, and I, and I bought that book. I didn't understand it at all. I think it was a freshman or a sophomore. But I used to walk around with carrying it, it, carrying it, Did it help you meet women, or caressing it, it sort of. <laughs> I just wanted to know what was inside that book. <laughs> and then when I began to understand it a little bit and learn that there was this big issue, how do you incorporate quantum physics into gravity, I became very, very caught up with, with that notion and basically stayed in that area ever since. Now, I'm trying to remember, because uh, I think I was at Harvard when you were still a student there. Uh, uh, but had string theory already, wait, I mean, you were interested in gravity, but string theory hadn't yet no, taken off. No, it, it was an interesting timing. So I, w I graduated in 84 and went to Oxford. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, fall of that year, fall that of was 84, big year. was really the big breakthrough year. So at Oxford, there was this sense at first, when I first got there, I have to say, the older student said, turn back. Yeah, quantum gravity, at the, before string theory, it was the dead end. Dead All end. All these good students want to do it, and you never heard their name again. And moreover, there were even particle physics students who yeah. said, this field is drawing up. And it was a real kind of depressing couple of months hearing the older students with that perspective. But then, you know, this big shot out of the blue, these discoveries in string theory, just changed everything. Now, maybe now, it, maybe now it's time to talk a little bit, a little science. So, so maybe want to fill in a little bit about what's what happened. What was the major breakthrough that 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 made string theory of interest to people? And, and then sure. we, can, we can go on. I mean, maybe maybe thirty seconds back sure. on, on string theory itself. Yeah. So, as many of you may be familiar, well, I you know I, think I guess the, already, the audience it's, already knows yeah, all yeah. the string theory. Yeah, that's right. You I forgot where I was. Yeah, that's um, right. It's, it's ASU. Now, come on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody want a little bit of? Background stream. Yeah. Okay, good. So, you know, in the in the 20th century, the two big developments that we all study intently were Einstein's breakthrough in understanding gravity, the general theory of relativity, and the other breakthrough in a field called quantum physics that focuses on the completely other realm of the spectrum in terms of size, the small things. General relativity big, quantum mechanics small. The weird thing was when you tried to put them together, the math just wouldn't work. So this was a big puzzle. And string theory is an approach that tries to resolve that puzzle, put gravity and quantum mechanics together into one theoretical package. And the only feature of the theory that really, I think, is worth keeping in mind, because it's very visual, string theory suggests a new way of thinking about the ultimate constituents of matter. You know, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, we view them as little tiny dots traditionally. String theory suggests, and I underscore suggest, these are not proven ideas, but inside of these little dots, string theory suggests you'd find something else, a little tiny filament, a little tiny string-like entity that vibrates. And it's called string theory. It looks like a little piece of string. And the idea is that the different vibrational patterns of this little tiny filament is what gives rise to the different particles. A string vibrates one way, it looks like a quark. It vibrates a different way, it looks like a photon. So all the particles are the different musical notes, if you don't mind that a metaphor, that the little tiny strings can play. That's the basic idea. And, and there's another important component of it, a very important component of it, is that string theory to be, to be mathematically consistent requires extra dimensions. Maybe it's very important. They tend, the strings vibrate not just in the dimensions we see, but in principle, dimension, extra dimensions, which is a major challenge of string theory because most of us Usually, most of us in the room usually are used to just four or three, in fact. And, and, you know, and we rarely throw a baseball and have it disappear into an extra dimension. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. That's absolutely right. That is one of the strangest implications of the theory. So when I said that you put general relativity and quantum mechanics together in one mathematical package, what I really should have said is there's a mathematical framework that when you study it, you find that it fails if there are only three dimensions of space. That is, if you only have left, right, back, forth, and up, down, these three dimensions that we all know about, the math breaks. 